Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. God bless each one of you. We're looking now at Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 20. I'm preaching through Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. Here we are in verse 17. I'm going to read down it with you to the end of verse 28, and you will uh, see this on the screens as well so you can read. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. We're reading down the end of verse number 28. Let's begin to read. Now, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. It's called up because Jerusalem is on a ridge of hills. So when you go to Jerusalem, you go up. So he was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. And the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with, with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in the kingdom of heaven. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink, referring to his death? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they had been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the other two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is in control of the future. He's in control of his future, and he's in control of the world's future. You see, as he said elsewhere, my life is not being taken from me. I'm giving it up willingly. And what he meant by that was, this is all God's plan. It's what God has been working for the last thousands of years to, to bring to fulfillment that I could die for the sins of man. And so I'm not here, and I'm not going to my death because people have taken control of me. I'm doing this willingly. I'm in control of the process. And so Jesus, for the third time, he does it one more time in the, in the upper room before the Last Supper. For the third time, he tells his disciples, using almost exactly the same words, what's going to happen when he goes to the cross. He tells them about being arrested by the Jewish leaders. He tells them about being persecuted by the Romans. He tells them about his death and how he's going to rise from the grave. He tells them the whole thing. And so Jesus lets us know what he's going to do. And then this is really important. Everything he said happened just as he described it. Jesus was right. Now, I believe in Jesus as my Savior for many reasons. For many reasons. One of the reasons I believe him as Savior is that every time he said something was going to happen, it happened. Now, in the Old Testament, the test of a prophet was that when the prophet spoke, he spoke truth. And what he predicted would happen, happened. Uh, that's, that uh, was something that uh, was used to test prophets. Now, when a prophet made a prophecy and it wasn't true, they killed him. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's a pretty big penalty, right, for, being, for telling a bad prophecy. Well, the reason was that that person was false. He was not doing something that was true. He was doing something that was false. He was a liar, just putting himself up as a prophet when he wasn't. But Jesus was not like those Old Testament prophets who were false. Everything he said was true. And so, using the test of the prophet, since he said what, what was true, he was who he said that he was. So that's one of the reasons... I believe who Jesus was and that he was real and he was true. So whatever he said happened. Now, I want to do an extended application of this for the time that we live in. I became a Christian in 1968. I was 16. Do the math. Okay? I was 16 years old. And right before I became a Christian, there was the Six Days War between the Arab states and the Israeli state. And teachers, people who were studying Bible prophecy, used that as one of the signs that the Lord was returning. And I heard a lot about the Lord's return 
in those first few months after I became a Christian. So I made a study of it. It was how I am. I made a study of it. I read the book of Daniel over and over again. I read the book of Revelation over and over again, and I was struggling to understand. And let me say before I go on that I believe that Jesus Christ is going to return. I believe it. Now, theologically, I'm, even, I'm, I'm what's called evangelical, but my heart is fundamentalist. I believe the fundamentals of the faith. And one of the fundamentals, one of the five fundamentals is that Christ will return literally. It'll be a real return. I believe that with all my heart. I want him to come back today. Even though the Braves just made the playoffs, I want him to come back today. And I really mean that. And sometimes I sit around and I contemplate, I think, about what it will be like when the Messianic kingdom takes place and Jesus Christ is here on the earth, he's Lord it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. I want him to come back. Now, with that being said, uh, let me also remind you of things we've studied in Matthew's Gospel together, that our forgiveness of each other should be limitless, that we should not let politicians divide us over issues like race and the virus, that the Church of God should be one, that we're here to, to, to love each other and to serve each other. These are things that Matthew's gospel, that Matthew's gospel has been teaching us. So with the idea that, that I believe Christ is going to return very soon and we should have grace and forgiveness for each other, almost immediately after I became a Christian and I started studying these things, I found out that a lot of teachers were teaching things that weren't true. And I had my heart broken. But I wanted Christ to come back so so much, and then for teachers to teach what they were teaching, and then it not come true, and there'd be no repercussions for it. It's happened over and over again in my life and ministry. I became a youth pastor at 20, and then I became a pastor of a church at 26. When I became a youth pastor at 20, the whole Israeli Arab thing was still swirling around, and all the teachings about our Lord's second coming. And then the year I became a pastor, uh, the Iranians that were overthrown by the is Islamicists and they took Americans hostage at the embassy. I don't know if anybody has even heard of this, but that's what happened. And I remember watching TV every night. America held hostage, day 103. So we, we went through this long hostage crisis as the Iranian Islamicists held our people in the embassy. And again, the, the, the teachings arose that this was a sign of the second coming, a sign of the end times. And then, you know, I, I, I was pastor of a church, and so I only had two churches. I was pastor 11 years in my first church, 31 years here. And um, uh, in, in, in 1988, a NASA engineer wrote a book. The book was 88 Reasons Jesus is Going to Return in 1988. And then he didn't return, so he wrote a book, 89 Reasons Why He's Going to Return in 1989. Now, I know we laugh at this, and you should. I mean, it's, it's funny to say that, but he wasn't a bad man. He was a believer. He was searching scriptures. He was struggling through the process, and, you know, I read his books. People came up to me and said, Pastor, why aren't you teaching this in our church? I said, because I've read the books, and I don't agree with the conclusions that he has. And, of course, our Lord did not return. Now, let me stop for, and say something. Every time... Prominent Christian leaders predict the coming of our Lord and give a date, and the Lord does not return. That hurts the spread of the gospel. Because those people who are cynical will point and say, you said this and it did not happen. Jesus spoke and it was always true, but we speak and you're, we're oftentimes wrong. And by the way, I am wrong all the time. I'm not even sure if I'm right 50-50. I discovered I was wrong all the time when I got married. <laughs> Before I got married, I wasn't complete. Then I got married, now I'm finished. <laughs> and then I came here as pastor, and almost immediately the Soviet Union fell, deteriorated from within. And again, that was used as signs of the second coming and signs of the end times. But let me tell you about the big one which for a lot of people who have been born since the year 2000, or maybe you were young when it happened, you don't remember, it may seem surprising to you, it was called Y2K. Long about 1997, uh, 
computer programmers were going to say there was a problem with the, the Microsoft operating system. And uh, Christian teachers grabbed a hold of it and, and said in the year 2000, when the, when, the, when the clock ticks over from December 31st, 1999 to January 1st, year 2000, uh, planes will fall from the sky, bank accounts will be empty, the whole system of, of politics around the world will collapse because of this problem with the Microsoft operating system. This was actually said now. And what happened was Bill Gates, when he developed the, the Microsoft operating system in the, in the 1970s, he never considered the possibility that it wouldn't be obsolete by the year 2000 and that some other system would replace it. And so he didn't work the calendar, the clock inside of the system to go past 1999, December 31st. And so the, how it works in the Microsoft operating system is this, that every file is tagged with a date. And if you can't find the file, the system will not work. Now, I used Macintosh computers, and I was thinking to myself, I'm going to rule the world. <laughs> oh, this is a live crowd, live crowd. So we had some programmers in our church, and also I read uh, computer journals, and um, got an interest in computers. And I was reading that the computer programmers were in charge of it. They were going to get it fixed before December 31st of 1999, and then I had some programmers in the church who, by the way, were making big bucks because they were doing this job of reprogramming the systems, and they said, oh, we're going to have it fixed by then. Now, I would, I would go home from church. I love preaching, and just like you, I don't get a chance to hear good preaching very often. <laughs> so I go home oftentimes, listen to preachers preaching. The, the pastor who's still there of this prominent mega church. And he was, he was, every Sunday he was talking about Y2K. Every Sunday he was talking about the, the, that Y2K was going to be the beginning of the tribulation period. Every Sunday he was talking about the, the coming of our Lord. And then, if you don't know this, December 31st, 1999, 12 o'clock midnight came. The clocks ticked over and nothing happened. And he still has his church. And he still has his big offerings. And he still has his TV ministry. And there was no repercussions for him being wrong. And then I, I, I can go on with forever, but you know, we had the Mayan calendar in 2012. Remember this? The Mayan long calendar was going to count over, and somehow or another people took the Mayan calendar from a secular pagan religion and took it over to the New Testament. I was playing golf, and this guy came up, and I knew, he said, can I play with you for a while? I said, okay, we played a few holes together. And he began to push me about, is Christ coming back in July, or when is my Mayan calendar going to come back? And, and I, eventually, I got frustrated. I don't get frustrated very often once a year maybe, I looked at him and said, listen, I got a 10-foot downhill putt for birdie. <laughs> Jesus is going to come back when he comes back. <laughs> and of course, you know he didn't return in 2012. Now we're doing the same thing. It seems like it happens every 10 years. Now we're doing the same thing with the virus. Now listen, I want to hear your opinions. You, you can have all kinds of opinions. But we've been so wrong so many times that we should be humble and gentle, understanding that there may be different opinions and willing to forgive each other and not to let the virus divide us against each other. Let me tell you one of my favorite stories. I've told you before. I'll probably tell you again because every time I tell the story, it gives me chills. Before World War II, Christians in Germany had to make a decision. And I, I can understand where they were because they did not know that the Third Reich would only have a short period of time. And so many Christians gave in to the Third Reich. That happened in the Church of the Brethren. Many of their pastors, many of the leaders gave in and collaborated in order to be able to continue having church and having ministry. Others in the, in the Church of the Brethren, other Christians said, we can't, we can't deal with this. We can't support this man and this, this, this evil system. And many of those pastors went to jail and were executed for their faith. And many churches were broken up by the Nazis. When the war was over, the Church of the Brethren had a gigantic convocation. And those who collaborated and those who didn't came together in a quiet, inside-the-walls meeting the, the spokesperson came out. The press was waiting. The press said, what happened? And the spokesman said, I'm getting chills right now. We prayed. The Holy Spirit came. And we were one. Now, if the Church of the Brethren did not let Hitler divide them, how can we let a virus divide us? 
The truth of the matter is that this virus is going away. The bubonic plague went away. Smallpox, which, by the way, hit Dee Creek in 1905. Killed a lot of people in Dee Creek. Went away. Polio, which, which paralyzed thousands and thousands of kids and killed children when the year I was born. It went away. Yellow fever hit Portsmouth in 1855 and Norfolk as well. It killed one-third of the population of Norfolk and one-half the population of Portsmouth. It went away. I hate COVID. It killed my mother. You know the story about Sarah, don't you? My daughter-in-law, what she went through in the hospital, 22 days in the ICU. I've been, I was quarantined three times. I've had the virus myself. Praise God, only had sniffles. But it's going away. And when it goes away, the church of God needs to be one, and we will have an unprecedented opportunity to minister and talk to people who have been hurt and injured by a horrible disease and went for Jesus Christ. That was my extended application. <laughs> now, it is our natural desire to be in control. Now, God's in control of history, but our natural desire is to push God out of the way and for us to be in control. Now, it's not that, that way with everybody. There are, there are many believers who are very humble and very, and very soft about their faith, but there are unfortunately, probably the majority who want, at least in some parts of life, to still be in control. This was the problem with uh, James and John. They, they wanted to be in control. Now, their mom went and talked to Jesus. Don't you just love moms? Aren't they something? But she, they put her up to this, and they thought that, that mom would have a, a, an easy lever on Jesus than what they would have. And so the, mom said, hey, can my two sons, James and John, can one have the, the place at the right hand, the place of highest honor? And can one have the place of second honor at your left hand and the messianic kingdom? And Jesus looked at James and John and said, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? In other words, can you die like I'm going to die? They didn't understand what he was talking about. And they said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And he said, come and think of it, you will. James was the first of the disciples who was martyred for the faith. He was killed by a Roman soldier run through by a sword. Acts chapter 12. And John spent years on the island of Patmos in jail and in exile. So they did drink Jesus' cup. But you know, this is interesting. It doesn't matter how much you suffer. It doesn't matter how much money you get. It doesn't matter your pedigree in the church. It doesn't matter your genealogy. None of those things matter. The, 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 the New Testament idea of leadership, now you listening now? I know we're Baptists, so take this word, is charismatic. Now, what a charismatic means is this. It's brought by the Holy Spirit. That God puts aside those who are leaders. It's his choice. And that's why Jesus says, it's not for me to give. It's determined by the Father. And so leadership inside of God's church, inside of God's kingdom, is charismatic, given by the Holy Spirit. Technically speaking, we do not elect our leaders. We recognize the gifting of the Spirit given to certain individuals. We call our pastors, we call our leaders, and, when we, and that's a good word we should not give up. We don't employ them. We call them. And the call is a recognition of God's call. It parallels God's call. So all the things we do as leaders inside of God's church, we do by the call of God. We don't put ourselves there. God puts us there. Now, when I was in seminary, I, was, I, went, I attended a mega church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and... Um, Every Easter, we had a living Lord's Supper, or Last Supper, I should say. And we have living nativity here, right? Isn't it great to have living nativity? Well, we did a living Last Supper. So the pastor was always Jesus, and then there was auditions in the church for the 12 disciples. Sit at the table, you know, and we see the Lord's Supper. And then when the, the, the supper got to the last person on the table on both sides, it then continued to the congregation. Isn't this cool? So uh, we had an eccentric man in the church, very eccentric, and he auditioned for a role as a disciple, and he didn't get a part. So a night came for the living Last Supper, and it was happening, and the, a side door opened up, and this man walked out in full costume, this eccentric man, who had been denied a role. Get this? Wearing tennis shoes. <laughs> and he came and sat at the table. 
the 13th disciple. <laughs> he couldn't take no for an answer. He called himself, put himself at the table with Jesus. <laughs> and we do that. We say, hey, the church needs my leadership, needs my opinion, it needs what I have to offer, what I have to give, and I'll put myself there. One man told me, Pastor, listen, I, I, I love you, but when I'm inside the car, i got to have my hands on the steering wheel. And what he was saying was, I have to lead. I can't have it any other way. But that's not the New Testament pattern. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because it's further explained here. It's further explained. Because our natural inclination is not only to want to lead, our natural inclination is to fight. To fight with each other. Because I'm not where I think I should be, when I don't have the role I think I should have, then I'm going to fight other people to get that. And let me say, there are times when we should fight, especially over the nature of Christ and the nature of salvation. Paul did it in the book of Galatians. He fought. But normally speaking, when we have differences of opinion about things, we should talk about it and work them out. That's godly. So the disciples, they heard about James and John, they were indignant. Now, each of the times that Jesus explains, all four times he explains what's going to happen to him, his death, the disciples immediately begin to fight. Do you see the irony there? You get the irony? I'm getting ready to die on the cross for the sins of mankind. And, and then the disciples go, oh, yeah, okay. They start fighting each other. Makes absolutely no sense. I don't get this at all. But that's what they did because that's our natural inclination is to fight. And Jesus says, listen, okay, you want to lead, that's given by God. If you really want to lead, then you decide not to be a leader, but to be a servant. You turn the proposition around. It's called the great reversal. Over and over in the New Testament, we have the great reversal. The first will be last. The last will be first. You get this, right? So if you want to be a leader, then you put yourself last. Be a servant to everyone, just as the Son of Man came not to lord it over people. He could have, couldn't he? He earned it, right? He was the Son of God. But he said, I came to be a servant. And my servanthood will take me to death on the cross as a ransom, that is to buy back people out of slavery to sin to become free in God. And just as I have chosen to serve, you should choose to serve. John's gospel has the Last Supper and the washing of feet. You said, as I've washed your feet, you wash each other's feet. That's the New Testament idea of leadership. So if you want to be a leader in God's church, then you decide to be a servant in God's church. I tell the staff, we talk about this all the time, that we have what's an upside-down pyramid, that, uh, that you're at the top of the pyramid as a pastor, but you turn that around, everybody else is more important than you. Everybody in our church is more important than me. That's why, symbolically, I don't have a parking place. I park on the grass beside a shed. And the reason I have, don't have a parking place, I park on the grass beside a shed, is that I don't want to take a parking place from you. And that was really important back when everybody was coming to the church before the virus hit. Not as important now. If you want to lead, don't fight. Serve each other. Now, you know, uh, Sarah's illness was very hard on the family and uh, hard on her, on her daughters. Uh, Annalise is 22 months and Abigail is just a little bit over three years old. And So we took care of the girls and it was hard on them. Abigail used to just go into her bedroom and go to sleep at night. But then she was having a hard time going to sleep. And so I'm in the bedroom with her and I put her in the bed, you know, helping out. And I said, honey, you've got to stay in your bed. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't stay in bed. I stuck out of my bed into the hallway and watched TV. So I was, you know, sympathetic. I said, honey, you got to stay in your bed. You can't get out of your bed. I'm going to stay right here and watch you. And so she was upset with me. She looked at me. Now, now listen, I call her my, my, my best big buddy. And Annalise is my best little buddy. Now I got Swin. He's my best littlest buddy. And we're going to have another little boy this week or next week, and he's going to be, I guess, my best little buddy also. So I got the littlest buddy. So Abigail looked up at me and she said, Dada, I said, What, honey? You're no longer my best buddy. <laughs> I said, What am I then? Just a friend. 
I thought, my gosh, I've been ghosted by a three-year-old. <laughs> That's a term the kids use, you know, ghosted. And then a few days later, we're on the front porch, and Sasha, the dog, comes up, and Abigail puts her arms around the dog and says, Sasha, you're my best buddy. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I've been replaced by a dog. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question, Dale. Are we going to... I've, I've had people tell me, I have lost friends over politics. I have lost friends over the virus. Is this servant leadership? We disagree about some issue. You're not all my best buddy. You're lucky if I even call you a friend. Now listen, this is how it works in God's kingdom. Everybody's more important than me. You say the same thing. Everybody's more important than me. And I'm here to serve everyone. And I want to lead not by, by, by forcing my way in, but by, by, being, made by showing God I'm worthy for him to charismatically give me the gift of leadership and to use me in his kingdom. And right now, inside of God's kingdom, we need a lot of people who will lead out and say, this virus will not defeat this church, or the church in America, when it's over with, we're going to move in and see people saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are coming now uh, to think about this passage of Scripture and how Jesus was always right, and we human beings, not so much. Yet we get so prideful, boastful about our positions Theologically, eschatologically, that is about the end times. We fight over them. At a time when the church should be brought together in peace, we have been divided over differences of opinions. When we should be one, we have not been one. But now it's important that we become united so that we can take advantage of the unprecedented opportunity that you've given us in this world in the midst of a great tragedy, to bring out of that tragedy a new birth of the cause of evangelism in our nation. There are people here and also watching online who have not yet believed in Jesus. I pray they can believe right now. And they pray this prayer with me. Will you pray this prayer with me? Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. Will you forgive me based on what Jesus Christ has done for me on the cross? Will you come and live inside of me by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved in Jesus' name? If you pray that prayer, you're not part of the family of God. Welcome, my brother, sister. Let us know about, about your decision with the card in the chair or talking to an online counselor so we will be able to stay in touch with you and share with you more about how to grow in your faith. Now, Father, we pray that this scourge of the virus will very soon pass through my nation and that your church will be one to help build, rebuild your ministry here in this country and the world. In Jesus' name, amen.